for itself here, you know, you need a tractor at least 40 horsepower, um, a subsoil or a chisel plow, you know, you need a, if you have land like us, you, you're going to need a, a good moldboard plow, a really good disc, and definitely a rototiller. Uh, you need a, you know, good irrigation system, um, with all the fittings, you know, it all speaks here, the trencher, we don't own a trencher, so we rent it, you know, it's, uh, I think we rent it for like maybe a little over $100 a day, which isn't bad. If, you, if you're on top of it, you can get a lot done in a day. Okay, uh, the, the mulch layer, we rent that also. Joe, is that 120 a day for that? So we have, we have to, we have to That's right, we, we got it all. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Okay, okay. okay. All right, well. I mean, it all speaks for itself here. Um, you know, we, we use the four foot uh, mat, and we roughly use a 4,000 foot running row acre. That may be a little smaller than a, an actual acre, but that's what we, you know, kind of call it. So it's going to take 4,200 feet because your rolls of fabric are 300 uh, feet each, you know, so you're going to have a couple hundred extra feet there to work with. Uh, our drip lines was 25 mil drip line with 24 inch uh, spaced emitters. And we borrowed our uh, neighbor's propane torch to get the job done. <laughs> one, one thing about the, the T-tape, well it's not T-tape, but the drip line, we prefer using hard, hard ram line, something that lasts longer, rodents don't get into. But the 25 mil is the biggest that will go through this machine, at least the ones that we use. Unless you want somebody out in front of the tractor trying to hold it into place. But this line goes through the pipe and you can adjust it to either side of the row. You can put it on the surface, you can put it six inches down. But anyway, that, that's the reason we use that particular drip line. <coughs> Eight, eight foot um, end posts, you know, at least minimum a six inch diameter of that. And uh, need at least one, you know, one on each end of the rope. You need a post driver or an auger. Um, you can rent those if you don't own one. We use seven foot T posts with the wire clips, 468 uh, per acre. And then we have a couple of different kinds of T-post pounders. We're going to show you a picture of that um, in a little bit here. And we use a 12-gauge high tensile um, fence wire. Okay, there's a couple of different kinds of... A um, uh, couple of different kinds of ends for your, your wires to go on your end post there. One is the grippler. We've never used that before, but it seemed like it's pretty good little... Uh, gadget there. We use the wire vices right there and then um, the branch lock would be the one that picture on the right right there. That's that's how we affix the canes to the wire with that right there. And I don't think you can hardly see it but that bottom picture right there shows a branch lock around a, a blackberry cane. Okay and um, 10,000 of those should do an acre. Um, that's 700, 750 plants of blackberries per acre. Okay, Joey, help me out on this. <coughs> well, before you buy your first tea post or your first plant or whatever, you really need to know where you're going with them. An acre doesn't seem like a lot. Um, I think I told you before, we didn't know anything when we started, had no idea of production. Anyway, the first year is not going to be that major for you because you're not going to have a full crop. But the second time around, you better be ready. And they don't stop. They don't stop for the rain. They don't care if you don't sleep, eat, or whatever. <coughs> They're coming. Be ready for them. Um, you also want to know, look into where you're going with your processing. Not all of these berries are going in cups. 
you're going to have rain damage, you're going to have sun damage, you're going to have worker damage, you're going to have dropped fruit. Um, and an acre of berries, you're going to have a considerable amount of, of coal berries, unless you just have one, one year on earth that's like heaven. And it ain't happened to us yet anyway. <laughs> Where do you usually send those berries? You get something out of them? Yeah, them yeah. The I mean, you want to look into maybe wineries, um, some of the... Uh, distilleries. Right? Yeah, distilleries. We're looking into that a little bit. Some of the breweries. Just anybody that can use fruit that doesn't need to go in a clamshell. Right. You know, you have to kind of research that a little bit. You know, know your market. Are you going to direct market or... Like um, like a lot of the people do, the CSAs, the farmers market, the farm stands, pick your own. You can do all of the above to get rid of all these berries. But you need to have an idea of where they're going anyway. Pearson? I was going to say the other thing you can do with them is if you have commercial kitchen space, you can make jam. And yeah. A lot of people don't. Check your county and see if there's a cannery in your county. Lots of times... Even if you can't go out and make the jam, you can contract them to make your jam for you. Yeah. So you just send them their your your call fruit and a check, and they'll send you back all the jam. So if you're in any of these direct marketing spaces, then you can sell your jam that way. Yeah, be sure and test their product too. Make sure yes. it's something you want to sell. Right. So we've gone through that before, and it wasn't something I wanted my name on. But anyway, okay. Um, I guess Jeff will right. be telling you about this anyway. Well, the next one we're going to go over is your location. You know, you need to, um, you've decided you want to plant an acre of blackberries, and, you know, you need to decide where they're going to go. Um, you need to know something about what was on the land before you, you planted. What's the history? What's, what, what's going on with the last five years on this piece of land? You know, did it have tobacco on it? Did it have wild berries growing on it? Um, weeds? Did it have winter wheat? You know, things like that. Cover crops, I, that's, I would recommend that. You know, planting your berries behind several years of cover crops would be ideal. Okay, the next thing, you need at least eight hours of sunlight. That's a minimum. So more the merrier, really. Um, you need some irrigation water. Where are you gonna get it from? You know, is it a well, is it a pond? Um, is it a river? You, you definitely have to have good air drainage and water drainage. And like I said before, the wild bramble thing, you know, they, they, you have to deal with those. If you don't deal with them, they're certainly going to deal with you. Um, you need to establish which way your, your rows are going to run. Um, we recommend east to west. Our land, uh, not all our land is appropriated for east and west. If some of the land we have on our farm, if we planted east to west, would have so much e uh, erosion, you know, it's, it wouldn't work. So, But we recommend east to west, and there, there's a reason for that. Question. Does your land have to be absolutely flat? What's the uh, highest slope? Uh, well, we don't have a flat one piece of ground on our land at all, so, um, Less than five anything it won't wash away. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you got to follow good practices on that, you know, I mean. but a, a nice slope piece of land is ideal for brambles, Yeah, well, it really is. Why, why do you recommend east and west? Um, well, you can use a shift trellis on east and west. Um, that's what we do. We we shift it so our fruit is on the north side of the road. It gets more. It gets less sun damage that way. That's prime. Even a even a road that's run two side at east and west seems to do better for us on east and west. Okay. Soil testing. You know, you need to get that done uh, prior to planting. You know, so. And, and follow the recommendations. All right. Once again, you've decided you're going to plant um, some berries. 
you don't want to get your plants from your neighbor unless he is a you know a licensed nursery and even if he's a licensed nursery you need to do your homework we learned our lesson we learned our lesson very hard on that too um, you know there's a couple of different materials for planting one would be your bare root top right and then you have your tissue culture down at the bottom uh, we strongly recommend using the tissue culture um, in the fall you need to subsoil or use your chisel plow and get it ripped as deep as you can go ahead and turn it and uh, let the land lay fallow early spring we get out the disc you know we try to get all the clumps and everything get it as smooth as we possibly can and then we will uh, re incorporate our fertilizer and lime as recommended. Joel, you, you want to try this? Um, the piece right there beside the wording, that's one of our risers that comes up off of the sub-main. Um, when you put in, you want to put your irrigation in before you ever plant, really. And when you put your risers up, we, we used to use cheaper, smaller stuff. I mean, that that I'm holding in my hand right there is about $4 for each one of them. You can probably do it for a dollar and a half or two dollars. We just found using the, the full one and a half inch sub main all the way up through the elbow, even to the nipple that all you do is connect your line to. Weed eaters, <coughs> mowers, things like that that bump into them. I tell you what, in July, I'd like for you to come dig a couple of those things up for me sometimes when it gets dry. It's better to have them substantial so that you don't break them off. So, But anyway, if you have more than 3% grade on your field, we highly recommend, we've just learned this, it took us 25 years to learn it. <laughs> Highly recommend a pressure regulator for each one of your rows to make sure that each one of your rows are, are being watered properly. The 25 mil tape, they claim that it, it emits the same at six pounds all the way up to 25 pounds, and it does pretty much. But if you've got a pretty good slope on your field, you're gonna find more water and fertigation at the bottom of the hill than you are at the top. So we highly recommend those. They're about nine or ten dollars a piece but in the long run it doesn't take long to pay for it. But um, and then the soil, Jeff you want to do All that? Right. Okay um, you get the proper machinery and you can lay your uh, landscape fabric and your drip line at the same time you know and that's, that's kind of neat and the, uh, the, your bed is built also at the same time. Uh, one thing you need to do for sure, make sure that um, drip tape is buried underneath the surface of your soil one and a half to two and a half inches in general. Um, and your distance of your rows 10 to 15 feet, you know that depends on your machinery that you have that you're going to be using. And um, before you before you plant your plants, you may want to go ahead and, and plant your row metals with the type of grass or forage or whatever that you want to put in there and do it before you burn the holes to plant your plants because you burn your holes, go out there and start throwing grass seed and you know, you can, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out. Uh, okay, right before you plant you want to run your, run your irrigation system. Uh, and then that'll show you where your emitters are. Like we said before, we, we use a 24 inch spacing on uh, the drip line. We prefer planting our, our blackberries six feet apart. So you know you're going to have a two foot, two foot, two foot, so it's simple there. You know every third emitter a plant's going to go there. Well you, you crank up your system, it'll kind of show you where it is. We also have a marked uh, measuring stick we use a piece of PVC and we mark every two feet and you know it just simplifies everything. Uh, carefully burn your hole uh, for your plant. You know your, your, your tissue culture plant 
is, is very small. It's a very small plant and it's a very small plug. So the smaller the hole, the less weed problem you're going to have the first year. There, there, but after that year, like the next year and the year after, you're probably going to have to go back and enlarge your holes because your plant is going to grow, your hole is going to need to be bigger. All right, and okay. when it's time to plant, get your bed nice and moist. You don't really want it, you don't want it soaking, soaking wet. You want it just nice and moist, plant your plug. Um, plant your plug a half inch below the soil surface, and <coughs> from that point on, you want to monitor your soil uh, moisture until it starts growing. And then you may want to start, you know, thinking about fertigating. All right. Trellises. Like I said before, eight foot, six inch minimum. We prefer a post pounder rather than an auger. We don't particularly like chunking, chunking posts. So pounding it, believe me, it, it, you want to do that. Um, <coughs> We like to install our end post uh, 15, 20 degrees angle away from the row. Okay, install your T post every third plant. Being sure not to put your T post directly adjacent to your plant, you, we prefer to put them in between. Um, make sure the T post that the nipples are pointed in toward the bed and not on the out. Not on the outside of the bed. Joey? Okay, when you install your, your end posts, be sure that when you put them on the end that your sub-main is already buried and you're putting your poles at an angle. You don't want to drive your posts down through your irrigation line. Now, some of us had to learn at that. So, sometimes those posts just don't go exactly like they start. They'll hit a rock and take off on you. Anyway, you want to install your T-post pretty much on the edge of your black mat. Um, we've got some that we actually put on the outside of it, thinking that, uh, well, we don't want weeds to grow up around the holes where the T-post have gone into the mat. Well, we found out that it's a little bit far from the plants with the way we shift the trellis on, on this particular kind here that we're doing, it would actually be better to put them up on top of the bed in your plastic. And when you put them in, you put them in that 10 degree angle, lean them out just a little bit away from your, from your uh, plants. And then when you install your wire, we, <laughs> we've done it both ways and we've had a tangled mess. So now we install one wire at a time, and we put it in the end of the post. We put clamps on each one of them, on each one of the T-posts. Then we attach it to the wire vices and tighten it. Then we do another wire. We found out that we thought we were going to get this stuff done in a couple of hours. We were pulling wire out, pulling wire, pulling wire. People were putting them in the ends, and before you know it, the bottom one was on the top. The top was down in the middle. And Anyway, one, I hope this saves y'all a little time because <laughs> after we found out, it saved us some. All right, we put three levels of wire, one at about 20, one at 40, and one 60 inches high, which is pretty much standard. You can do it however you want to. Um, and then you use the wire vices on the ends or whatever to tighten them with. All right, when you go to tie the canes up, when you, when your plants get long enough to reach the bottom wire, you really don't want to try to tie them up at that time. You're going to find that the very tip of them are going to break off. And when that happens, then a bunch of laterals are going to start growing from the base of the cane, and your main cane won't be able to grow anymore. It'll be stuck right there. It's tilted right there on the bottom picture in the middle. That's the first tilt that we do. It's about 45 degrees. We'll probably get another five or ten more degrees out of it when we let go of everything and push it back out. We're just letting the canes acclimate. 
is what we're doing instead of just pushing them over. It's a pretty hard bend the way we do it, so we have to do it twice, which kind of makes it a little more expensive. But it still gives you 95% of the fruit on one side, which you'll see on the right right there. That's, that's some Chester right there that have been one-sided. All right, grower. Well, it's time to plant them again. We, we need to know what varieties we want to plant, you know. And it kind of depends on when do you want the fruit, you know. Do you want them in June, July, August? Do you want them in September, October? Or do you want them all above? You know, you have your June bearers, um, <coughs> Arapahoe. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. We grow Tupi, Kiowa, Navajo, Chester, and the ARC 45s there. That's what we have on our, on our farm now. Um, we start off pretty much, uh, the prime ARC 45s probably are the very first ones to come off. They'll start staggering in, and that's, that's the uh, fluorocaine too, that's not the primocaine part of it, the prime ARC there. So we start off with that, and then the tupi come on with a big wallop um, and just kind of take over the whole early early season. And they, they'll be done, they'll be done really by July 4th. Pretty much will be done. And by the end, we're, we're picking on the Kiowa really hard and the Navajo are just starting. And then we'll end up with the season with uh, Chester and Navajo and primarily Chester at the end. And, and then at the very, very end, the prime arcs will, will have a kind of a, I don't know, light to moderate crop, I would say at best, on those. So, you know, there's a lot more varieties to choose from. Um, that's just what we do, you know. There's some other ones up there. We've tried some of the other ones. We have tried Natchez and Wachita <coughs> and had terrible results with them. Uh, other growers have had fantastic results with those. Not cold berry farm. Um, we're looking to get Osage um, and the Vaughn, I don't really know a whole lot about that, but people are starting to plant it. I know, uh, what was his name? I forgot his name. Not Pearson. Uh, yeah, 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 he's got two acres of those brand new planting. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cost of um, putting it in the ground. You got your plants, your mat, drip line. That's a, that's, a, that's a wide range of the financial aspects of this business, you know. It's what you can make of it. That's a great thing about America. We can take blackberries and make money out of it. It's possible to do that. But you gotta work, you know, you're, never mind. Not gonna say that part. You gotta work. <laughs> Folks, that's it. <laughs> We've got to the end of it.